Welcome everybody to this uh, second in our series of Code of Ethics webinars, uh, co-hosted by the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance and the Walkley Foundation. Before we go any further, I wish to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the land of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Woonwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. I grew up on Kauna lands in Adelaide and I was born on Larrakia lands in Darwin. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And uh, on this reconciliation week, uh, four years since the uh, Uluru Heart Statement of the Heart, I recognise the violence and the injustices our First Nations people continue to endure to this day. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Karen Percy. I'm the co-vice president of the media section of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance. I'm also a director of the Walkley Board and I chair the DART Centre Asia Pacific. Uh, uh, today's webinar, Handle with Care, Reporting with Respect for Privacy, Grief and Trauma, explores two particular aspects of MIR's Code of Ethics. They are provision number eight, which looks at uh, use of fair, responsible and honest means to ma obtain material, identify yourself and, and your employer before obtaining any interview for publication or broadcast, and never exploit a person's vulnerability or their ignorance of media practice. And we're also looking at provision number 11, that's respect, private grief and personal privacy. Journalists have the right to resist compulsion to intrude. We have a terrific lineup for today's discussion and I'm going to introduce them. Uh, we've got Caro Meldron Hanna. She has won many, many awards, including a handful of Walkleys, including uh, reporting on an expose into live baiting in the greyhound racing industry and the mistreatment of children in detention in lockup in the Northern Territory, which sparked a Royal Commission. She's also the co-creator of the television documentary series, Exposed. Kate Kiriakou is an award-winning journalist, author and podcaster who has been writing about crime for nearly two decades in South Australia, Victoria and now Queensland. She's written about the abduction and murder of Sunshine Coast teenager Daniel Morecambe. She was Queensland Journalist of the Year in 2018 for her case-cracking reporting on the murder of 12-year-old Tialia Palmer. Ben Schneiders is a Walkley winning journalist, uh, investigative journalist from The Age. He focuses on industrial relations, business, social issues and politics. He has written extensively on the underpayment of workers, political corruption and on the labour labor movement. And his reporting has led to compensation for workers and penalties for companies. We're also going to hear from ABC in-house lawyer Grant McEvaney about the laws and privacy, and we'll have a presentation from the head of the DART Centre Asia Pacific, my colleague there, uh, Kate McMahon, who will tell us about best practice trauma-informed reporting. And we'll open the uh, 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 questions up to you, the audience, via the chat box. So please feel free to put your uh, questions in the chat box there and we'll get to them when we can. So. Firstly, I'm going to put a couple of questions to our panellists, our journalist panellists, starting with you, Caro Meldrum Hannah. How do the Code of Ethics guide your work? Oh, look, the Code of Ethics really, they guide my work, but I think they guide the work of the entire team. And they are also utilised, well, I utilise them to really guide my interactions with participants and sources. That is paramount to me. I mean, the, the series that we just made for the ABC, which was exposed, the investigation into the Lunar Park Ghost Train Fire of 1979, that the code of ethics was very much a guide to try and understand what the ethics, the privacy, the limitations of our participants and our sources was super important this time around because there was so much trauma. Um, so it's a guide for me, it's a guide for the team, and it's a guide for the participants because it gives them a bit of an anchor and footing to know what they're in for and getting to know you and how you're doing your work. And, you know, their right to say yes or no. Kate Kuriaku, how does it guide your work? You've been reporting on investigations on crime for a long time, nearly two decades. Um, how does that help to guide you? A huge amount of my work involves this sort of stuff. Um, almost on a daily basis, I have to have contact with people who are grieving or who are wrapped up in some sort of crime or trauma or tragedy. And so you have to be very, very careful about how you approach people, 
um, to me, and I, I do a lot of teaching with young reporters as well. And to me, I always sort of pitch it as you're giving someone an opportunity to talk to you and tell their story, that's it. If they don't want to, you've made that approach and you have to make that approach very carefully and as respectfully as you can. And we have a lot of discussions in this newsroom every day about how to make the approach, what, what you should say, um, what would they say, that, that kind of thing. So it's something we consider every day. Ben, your turn. How does it guide you, particularly um, you deal with, uh, you know, vulnerable people, you know, particularly those who've been exploited, for example, on the wage front? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, no, I, I think it, I use it every day. There's, there's obviously real life consequences for people that I speak to. If you did anything inadvertently to disclose their identity, if you, um, uh, you know, didn't respect their wishes uh, in how they want to be identified, they can lead to being deported, losing their job, um, all sorts, you know, dealings with kind of um, criminal middlemen, that kind of thing. Um, so the code of ethics are really important. They're, they give you a, a kind of a, something to work off um, and a lot of fundamental important principles. You kind of almost need to use that as a starting point and then to go a step further and to remember that for many people that you deal with, this isn't... Um, you know their day job or or another story or whatever. This this is their life and and um, the consequences can be significant. Whether a victim of domestic violence, um, child sex abuse, or, or wage exploitation. All right. So I'm going to ask each of you the same question. Firstly, again, going back to you first, Cara. How would you rate the ethicalness of the Australian media right now? On a scale of zero being eh, really not good, 10 being, oh, my God, we're so excellent. Where are we? For oh, you. gosh, okay. This is, this is a big question. When I, when I heard this was going to be asked, I thought, how on earth am I going to answer this? Because we don't want to point fingers. But, I look, elephant in the room, I think, and I think we all accept that at each different media outlet or organisation, there is probably a different approach and a different understanding of ethics, of how far you go, how far you encroach, how far you intrude, or whether you don't, when is a no and no? Um, so if everyone all in, all in the pool, I'd say we're, we're running at about a six out of 10. All right, uh, Kate Kiriaku, what do you reckon? Kate's, uh, we're just having some camera. Sorry. Thank you, there we're back. <laughs> I mean, I agree with Carol on that one. That's a very difficult question. But I, I truly believe that most reporters, and I do a lot of reporting out on the road with other organisations, and when you individually talk to journalists who are out at a scene, out at a crime scene, at a court matter, I've never had a conversation with any journalist on the road where I thought, you know, Jesus, mate. <laughs> you know, you, you have conversations with individuals and, and they are very concerned about, how they should present a news item, how they should represent people. It, it's the same thing all the time. However, you do hear stories and you do see reports where you, you know, fundamentally disagree with, with how that has been carried out. So it's the same with every organisation. Most people are good. Some people get it wrong. Um, I'd probably be a bit more generous than Caro. I'd say seven or an eight. Um, but certainly, you know, in every profession, there's people who who are less ethical than others. Ben, you're up. Um, yeah, look, I tend to agree it's a bit of a mixed bag. I, I think a big issue and a, a big difference between, you know, there's, there's, there's issues within particular organisations and across organisations. I think the big issue is uh, the different ability for reporters to push back. Um, I think organisations where... Uh, there's a stronger union, stronger workplace presence that invariably helps or a culture around these kind of things. But if you're isolated and you're easy to pick off, you fear for your job, you're on a contract, being asked to do something or being asked to push a boundary, um, I think is much more likely to occur in that kind of situation than, um, than not. Um, so that's the dynamic I reckon that needs fixing that, um, journalists and reporters feel like they don't have to do things or push boundaries or whatever um, and we know it goes on and we see we see the we see what happens there and it's it's damaging for the entire industry um but i agree with kate i think as a whole um you know 
most reporters or or the you know the vast majority of reporters are trying to do a good job and are and are trying to act in ethical ways. They're not, you know, they're not all Martin Destazios. Um respect to Martin. Um, but yeah, I, I think that dynamic is 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 the main issue that that it's the ability to push back or the ability to say no. Um, and out of 10? Probably six. All right, I might come back to this at some stage. So look, there's lots to talk about and we're gonna get into some of the specifics on um, the particular aspects of the code of ethics that we are addressing today. But to help us kind of navigate the rights and roles of respon uh, and responsibilities of journalists and the rights of, of ordinary citizens, we're, I'm going to call on Grant McAvaney. Uh, Grant is a senior media and entertainment lawyer with extensive pre-publication and litigation experience. He's worked for News Limited, uh, nine MSN, and now heads the ABC's litigation team. Grant has five minutes to tell you everything you need to know about uh, privacy. And uh, Grant, I'll give you a heads up at the four minute mark that uh, you've got a minute to go. Over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Karen. Um, I'm glad I've heard the speakers speak now. Um, I, was, I saw that the tickets for this event were about $11.64. So I was worried I'd signed up to some sort of sports bet regime. <laughs> um, anyway, look, I, I love working for journalists and uh, that also extends to me spending an hour of my lunchtime with journalists voluntarily as well. There's a whole range of people who've caused me PTSD, um, including Karen, including Caro, and including Kate Kiriakou over the years. Um, I love them all, and I think very highly of them. I only just met Ben, but I'm sure he's trouble. Now, I don't really have time for a full-blown legal lecture, but what I'll do is just give you a kind of, I suppose, the structure of privacy law in Australia, which I think is the best way to try and analyse, look, there's some moral and editorial decisions you guys have got to make in these situations, um, but there's also the legal framework within which those decisions were made. Now, privacy law is a pretty political beast. Uh, it, it, the, the, the attention it gets politically goes up and down depending on the um, uh, circumstances of the day. Whether like uh, back in the day with the beautiful love story of Candace Fowlson and rugby league star Sonny Bill Williams having a having a steamy twist and getting their photo taken in a toilet cubicle, or um, big tech giants doing the wrong thing, it always goes up and down. But let me tell you what the structure actually is. So in Australia, first and foremost, there is no right to privacy. It's important to know that there is no common law legal right to privacy. This is our constitution. Doesn't have much room for anything, and there's no right to privacy in it. There is, um, to break down the kind of rules there are, there is at a federal level, the Privacy Act. Now, for the most part, for most people on this call, it won't concern you in any real way because that deals with the collection data, uh, sorry, the collection of data and the use of data um, by certain larger organisations. And there is also, generally speaking, a journalism carve out. So it won't, it won't affect you on the whole part. But then there are, so I suppose if we're breaking it down to five things, there is one, this is, this is a map of Australia, my hands are poorly making, I should say. So we've got the Federal Privacy Act, which probably won't affect you. Then there are the state and territory restrictions on what you can report legally. So it will affect the, the what, the content of what you do. Then there are also on the third level, a mixed bag of state and territory laws aimed at how you get that material, okay? So in the, the area of, of the topic that we're talking about today, all of these laws make a difference. So it's both the what you can report and how you get it. Then there is, again, and this is across the country, the common law breach of confidentiality. Um, we'll talk about that briefly. I've got a bit over two minutes to go. And then, of course, there are the editorial obligations. And I won't say much about the editorial obligations other than to say, depending on who you work for, there may be, in essence, legal consequences, um, not just editorial consequences. So to take um, the ABC or SBS or a commercial station, if they breach their editorial guidelines, there may be a um, on privacy or otherwise, there may be an appeal that can go to ACMA. Um, so you're still essentially stuck in formal proceedings. But what do you need to know? So um, let's knock out of the five, let's knock out the regulatory one. I've spoken about that. Um, I've spoken about the Federal Privacy Act regime, probably won't affect you in a, in a, in a real sense, um, but what I have to worry about with the others. So when we talk about um, 
restrictions on the kinds of things you can report. I think the best we can do here is to give you the alarm bells. Uh, there are just certain times where you need to follow what the legislation says and it all changed and it's all slightly different in each state and territory. So beware any reporting um, on this kind of issue that might go to um, victims of sexual offences, uh, those involved with guardian, people involved in family court proceedings, people with spent convictions, um, children courts, children's court proceedings, uh, certain people charged with sexual offences, um, and just suppression orders generally. So keep that in mind. Your alarm bell should be going off. Do I need to check something? Then if you're looking at how you get the material, so in these sorts of sensitive cases, how you get the material is just as important. So there you want to think about your use of listening devices. Are you being upfront? Are you getting consent? Your use of optical devices? Um, and also trespass and use of drones. So that's all about how you got access to the property. Did you get consent? Are you filming over the fence without permission, et cetera? Um, and then finally, I'll just wrap it up by saying, look, there is also the breach of confidentiality that a lot of people forget. Um, it's a broad common law provision that we don't have time to talk about, but I'll say this, I'll say this if Karen allows me. Um, it, it is a tort that can potentially apply to the misuse of confidential personal information. Okay, so for journalists collecting things such as, I use the old fashioned marital uh, information or sexual information, um, or uh, I might know another, a medical and health information that can arguably put you in the breach of confidentiality point. So um, I would just leave you with my general guide is if you think realistically that someone involved in your story won't like what you're reporting, you should take that as an alarm bell that there is some more exploring on the legal front you need to do. And sneaking in one final point, we're not even talking about your ability to protect your confidential sources you can do another Mia session on that as well, but just keep it in mind. The law I'll and the take that on board. I'll take that as a comment. I'll stop talking. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, we've got really fine investigative reporters um, with us today. So I'm going to um, go firstly to Caro. It's just like investigative journalism by its very nature is intrusive. You are trying to find out things that people don't want you to know, whether it's secrets or uh, government information, et cetera. So how do you balance that based on what we've heard from Grant, but also with the code of ethics? Because there's always going to be the skirting of lines, isn't there? Perhaps not the skirting of lines, but I think really it's incumbent upon us all as journalists to become experts as much as we can in the legal field as well as the editorial field. Um, because if you understand the law, you can get you can get much further often than if you really don't understand the laws and know how to push and where to push and how you can work with the law to achieve the outcome to, to broadcast or report the truth and the information. You know the the idea of intrusion that that, that description. I um I, I in my mind I try to I sort of psychologize that and and think of it not so much as an intrusion. And this may sound really lame, but it's more of an opportunity to get the to get the balance out there and the information and the material uh, out there. But look, there is always someone who is going to be unhappy with what you're reporting, that it, whether it be a target or it's the person in you know, the position of power and privilege who is running a system that is, uh, that is harming people. Um, and ethically, I think, to where that intrusion or often where that approach comes to that person is really important in the reporting. Do you go to that person early, the one who has most responsibility and most to answer for? Do you leave it to the end? What's right? What's fair? Um, it, it, it's all, and I think it's, you know, different for, for every single story, but I think the more you, the more you're trying to engage with those sources and those participants and get them involved in the journalism and the process of it, the better it's going to be at the end and the less of a shock and, and you can avoid a lot of anger too. And all, you know, raft of, of complaints that will come in after a big investigation where people feel they didn't have the opportunity to respond. They weren't given enough time. They weren't heard properly. The balance of the program was weighted more in, in that camp 
than the other in your interviews. So look, I'll just bring, manage. I'll bring Kate in here. Um, what are your thoughts? You've been dealing with, you know, some very prominent crimes in Queensland um, and other states, but more recently in Queensland, and including, you know, writing a book. Um, there's also, there's not just the people who don't want um, information out there, you know, corrupt politicians, whatever it might be, but when you're dealing with the, the kinds of families that you're dealing with with some of these crimes, where, you know, there can be a, a dependence sometime, these families very much depend on you in the early days, and then maybe if, if things change, then they might turn on you, or there might be a different attitude. How do you cope with that, where, you know, sometimes people are so dependent on you as a journalist, thinking you're their voice, but you've got a different job to do? I really haven't had a situation where uh, a family or people that I've been working with have, have turned on me. That, that generally doesn't happen. They often see you as an advocate for them. And I, I think in any investigation work, and I'm, I'm sure Caro and Ben would say the same, it, it doesn't so much matter that you're exposing wrongdoing or trying to get information out that people want to keep hidden. As long as you're fair about what you've said, I think it all works out okay. Even people who are in the wrong will acknowledge the work that you've done if you've been fair. Um, and particularly in police investigations where the family might have a perception that not enough was done in the early days or they've been ignored or, or that kind of thing. As long as you're fair on how you represent that, um, you'll find that most of their police colleagues will believe in what you're doing um, because they all want justice for whoever, you know, they all want it as well. They want everything to be done right. So that's always a big thing that I always keep in mind. Am I being fair here? Ben, uh, a lot of people, I think, do have um, some misconceptions about privacy and how it relates to them. You've kind of dealt with those who are trying to cover up and at the same time, those who've been affected by those cover-ups, be it, you know, the wage theft investigations that you've done or whatever. How do you deal with that reality of where the law meets practice and people's expectations? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of tricky, a lot of tricky issues. Um, I think I've come to the approach when you're dealing with someone who um, there's allegations of wrongdoing or you've uncovered some wrongdoing, that it's the best approach is really to drop the dead fish on the table in front of them and say, this is what I found. Um, this is what it shows and ask as many detailed questions as possible. You know, go uh, practically as, as early as you can uh, and with those questions. Sometimes you can't, you know, for a variety of reasons, something's fast moving or what have you, or, You've got other concerns about, um, you know, being, uh, I guess, spiked by them. But um, I think it's really good to be incredibly upfront with um, the people that are subject to this because it's, 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 you know, it, it'd be sometimes it could be the worst day of their life to get these questions or get these allegations, even if they've done the wrong thing. Um, so I think that's a good general approach in dealing with that. Um, I think it doesn't even matter sometimes if you do that, you still get incredible, you can get still get incredible hostile feedback. Um, that's been my experience. Recently, I wrote about Scientology um, and gave them weeks notice and sent something like 13 questions and hundreds of words of background. And the blowback was extraordinary. Now that might be, you know, a slightly exceptional case because of their reputation, but that's what does happen. Um, in terms of dealing with privacy, um, you know, there's, there's some really like specific cases I've dealt with that have been um, very tricky that um, you've got to balance a whole lot of things. A couple of years ago, we did a lot of reporting about um, a prominent union leader in Victoria and his domestic violence charges, John Secker. And for the first part of the story, we were able to report the detail of the abuse, which was leaked to us, things that he said that were sexist or misogynist. Um, and we couldn't name the person that he had um, allegedly offended against because of privacy laws. Um, that made it incredibly hard to report. Further down the track, we could report that. It was his wife, um, because that there had been a criminal case and other matters afoot that meant that you could only tell part of the story. So navigating that, navigating that ethically was hard. Can you go to the can you go to the alleged victim? How do you interact with the alleged victim? It's a live situation involving domestic violence, involving personal relationships, but it's not a personal matter. It's a public matter as well. It's in the courts. 
Um, it's a matter of public importance. Um, it, but yeah, it, it, it's not easy. You've just got to remember that you're dealing with, I think the thing to always remember with ethical questions and privacy questions is you're dealing with people and you, and you want to show them as much respect as you can. Thanks. Caro, you, uh, just picking up on what Grant was telling us about um, trespass and recordings, you know, covert recordings and, um, you know, the kind of video you might get from activist groups. How do you weigh up to, you know, sometimes you can't always ensure, I guess, that video you might mm. be getting has been got ethically that you would have done. So tell us the processes that Four Corners and your other um, producers go through when you're looking at those kinds of that material and how you weigh it up. Mm. Well, there is a there's a big difference between uh, you know using or installing a camera yourself, which I haven't done, or being gifted, receiving uh, vision that um, you know undercover footage that's been captured captured with these surveillance devices. And you know my experience has always been in in the latter, um, and that is when you are gifted, you receive this enormous amount of information, videos, audio, etc. And the, the task with that, it's really lengthy and it's painstaking. And that, that, that's really what occurred with the Greyhound Racing story, back at, which was done for Four Corners, and more recently um, with a, uh, the horse racing thoroughbred um, slaughter investigation. That takes a long time to verify the footage, to check it, to really understand what's on it, who's on it. You need to try and identify people. I mean, these were animals, so we had to identify animals. So an enormous amount of, you know, forensic painstaking work, matching symbols, markings on you know, the animal, the beast, whatever it may be, um, to, to really ensure that this, and it's actually captured at the place that you're told it's captured at. And then around that, you've got to go and verify everything yourself and be running your own investigation into that facility or person or wherever it may be. So there is so much that has to be done before you can show a frame of it and to understand too how it was captured and, and where it was captured. And if you do it right, fantastic, you can get it to air. Um, if it's not done the right way, um, you, you can't entertain it. So, and, and you need to ensure that also your sources are protected as well, whoever has provided you with that material. And that's you know something you've got to do right from the outset in, in any form of communication with them. So, um, you know, it, it, it can seem like, wow, what an enormous gift, but in the end, it's uh, painstaking, methodical, in the check, trenches. Check, 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 check and yeah. check again and check again, yeah. Kate, in this digital age, the, the so-called door knock, when journalists used to kind of front up to somebody's house, um, you know, and sort of say, confront them with things or, you know, what do you feel about somebody dying or something happened to somebody? That's been replaced with the social media stalk where anybody now can get on Facebook um, and, uh, you know, take photographs and, and the rest of it. It's, it's public. It's, a, you know, a forum where you're able to take it. Um, where do you stand on, on the use of that or how, how do you balance that? Um, you know, I don't know how much you might necessarily use it, but it's definitely a technique we're all using, uh, either Facebook or other sites, given that people aren't giving an opportunity consent all the time. I have a couple of different views on this because I'm kind of a bit old school. Um, I've been reporting and doing that sort of stuff for nearly 20 years, so I, I was part of that generation who would have to drive out to someone's house and knock on their door um horrifically one time I did this for a young man who died in a car crash that morning and when I knocked on the door the house was set up for his 18th birthday party that day so I've seen so many things like that over the years most people want an opportunity to talk about their loved one not everyone does but most people do um, in my experience. The social media element of it, um, sometimes people appreciate that um, a message via Facebook because it's less intrusive than rocking up at someone's door with a photographer and knocking on the door when they've got people there grieving, when they're planning a funeral. This way they could look at the message, you're not there in their face, putting them on the spot and they can consider it and either reply or not reply. So there's good and bad to it. I think it's always good to have a face-to-face -face approach with someone so that you're there. But a lot of people find it a lot easier if you've just sent them 
a message. Ben, different media agencies, and you alluded to this earlier, I think, you know, have different kind of standards for what uh, is, I guess, fair, responsible and honest, to quote part of the Code of Ethics, when it comes to digging out information. What advice would you have to hungry journalists, young journalists, new journalists, or those who are under pressure to bend the rules or to meet those KPIs and those clicks? It's a, yeah, it's a good, it's a really good, it's, it's, very hard question to answer um, succinctly, um, but I guess just to remember that you know this is just one day's work, and you have to live what you with what you do forever. So if you can push back, if you feel like you've got the ability to push back, you should. If you think you're being asked to do something unethical, and sometimes it can be you know it can be um, just quite subtle. What when I was a young reporter, I had to travel up to um, a horrific car crash in um, Northern Victoria where six young people had died. And it was a giant media circus and rightfully so, it was, a, it was a hugely traumatic. It was a, an, a, a man had had his kid on his lap and had driven into this group of teenagers at a party and, and killed six of them. Um, and you went up there and you need to tell the story of the community, but after two or three days, you could really sense the mood of the community change. They were, they were sick of the intrusion from journalists walking around asking questions. The families were sick of the intrusion. Um, and not that anyone was doing anything terribly wrong. It was just our presence there was starting to really wear on the town. Um, but of course, you know, back in Melbourne, the news desk wanted this story. It was an important story. It was a story people were interested in. And so there was, you know, not in a bad way, but there's pressure to keep going and keep getting these stories. But it was very clear just from walking around that this is not something that people wanted anymore. So you, do, I, you just have to kind of work out ways to, um, you know, play a bit dead sometimes. And sorry, you know, you know wrong use of the context, but to not, um, you know, just say, well, couldn't speak to them, couldn't do this. Don't be afraid to, you know, bend the truth in that situation with your editors to get the pressure off your back, um, I think, you know, because you, you need to respect people's grief and you need to respect the fact that this is a, one of the, the most traumatic moment of their life. I want to get all of you just to briefly um, uh, answer this next question. Sometimes media outlets argue that the ends justify the means. Now, for example, there was the incredible Al Jazeera investigation into One Nation and there were undercover informants, there was surreptitious video. Does public, public interest trump ethics in certain situations? I'll go to you first, Kate, this time. Uh, the short answer to, to that is yes. Um, I've never never done anything like that. Um, I don't even think I've ever misrepresented who I am. And I've had to acknowledge who I am in some very, you know, potentially dangerous situations and you still do it. However, when it comes to something that affects the entire community and is heavily in the public interest, then sometimes that information just needs to be out there. Police do the same thing with covert operations where they misrepresent all sorts of things because the ends justify the means. So I think you'd have to, it'd have to warrant a very, very serious situation to do that. But sometimes I think it does. Ben, do you agree? Was this the one of those times where the public interest trumped some of those ethical considerations, in particular the One Nation investigation? Which one are Walkley, by the way? Um... I think it's. I think it's just. It really, it really depends on the situation. I wouldn't say a flat no. I think occasionally it can, um, but it, it's. A, I think it should be a very high bar to cross. It's a problem with a lot of these questions around um, ethics and good practice. Is that there's not a clear cut yes and no to a lot of them. There's there's always a degree of greyness, um, but you've got to you've got to, you know. I think it's good to talk to other people, talk to your editors, talk to colleagues. You know, get get honest feedback about weighing um, the public interest against your kind of um, the importance of of acting ethically as well, and and whether the public interest at times can can try to trump um, uh, some of that. Caro, your thoughts? Yeah, I um. Sorry, you're there. Uh, just waiting for the the video to load up. I really, really 
tussled and struggled with this with this question. Um, I think in exceptional circumstances, yes, the public interest will it'll 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 justify it. But really, in exception, exceptional circumstances, and I think with the Al Jazeera um, program, what I struggled with that is that there was it was unclear where the lines were as to who was representing themselves and how they were representing themselves and who was in on that from the beginning with the reporting team. I mean, myself, like Kate mentioned, I have never misrepresented myself. I've always truthfully put myself forward as who I am and what I'm doing and where I am from. And I, I think sometimes, you know, there could be a bit of a fishing expedition for some people if they start up a covert operation. Do they actually know from the very beginning? Do they know at that very beginning that it justifies that? And to me, it's got to reach the bar of, you know, there is a crime being committed here. And it, you know, the old, the old saying, it, it, it takes a network to beat a network. Then you've got to raise your bar to try and expose that. But it's, it's up at that level, a crime being committed or something so heinous, something so wrong that affects a lot of people or, or a very marginalized group of people to justify that. I, I you know, I'm, the bar is you know, very high. But Absolutely. I think there was quite a lot of division in the industry. Over that yeah, time. yeah. We're at the halfway point and um, it's time to see what Kate McMahon has to say. Kate is a registered psychologist and a founding managing director of the DART Centre Asia Pacific, which focuses on trauma and journalism. Uh, Kate and I work together. I'm the chair of the board of the DART Centre and I'm really thrilled that um, I get to work with Kate because she's fabulous. And she's been a staff counsellor uh, and staff advisor on trauma and all things uh, journalism for a number of years, including dating back to the 1980s when she was a counsellor at the age. So take it away, Kate, you have five minutes. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for everyone on this panel. It's a fabulous conversation. Um, I want to pick on uh, three areas only. I want to talk about trauma on the victims, the people that you're talking about that you're reporting on, but also perpetrators and perpetrators families. I want to pick up on the audience and the journalist and ethics and morals around that. Um, what we need to remember with trauma is and traumatised victims that become the focus of your stories is that these people have been rendered powerless. Uh, that's what trauma does, that uh, the, the parents that have lost their child in a dr drowning accident have lost sense of, of power and control over what has been their loved one, of course, but also their life going forward, the dreams of how that child will grow up and whatever. So it's very different interviewing a family like that than it is Peter Dutton or Scott Morrison, people who are in power. We have to remember there's a real power imbalance. Um, and this is also true, and we haven't been talking about it today, of uh, the families of perpetrators. And this comes to mind for me because I am friends with uh, a young woman who's the sister of a man who committed a horrible crime of raping and murdering a young woman. Uh, and the, uh, that family member, that sister was hounded uh, by the media. Um, and so, you know, it's to remember that that person is also vulnerable. They haven't committed the crime themselves. So one way that you can give back power to victims and survivors is, and it's already been mentioned today, of always asking for permission, for permission to do the interview um, and to give back power by even simple things like asking if the person would like to stand over here or over there. Uh, just giving little bits of power back to the, to the subject. It's what Dennis Muller calls the principle of, of autonomy of the interview subject. Um, you may even consider, and I know this is a hot topic with journalists, but you may even consider sharing copy with, uh, with a victim uh, before it's produced. And that, that opens a whole can of worms, I suppose. Um, and picking up on Ben's point of going and uh, reporting on that community of the car crash. Um, I think if newsrooms and journalists become what we call trauma literate, understanding the trajectory uh, of trauma and understanding when the impact of trauma in a community happens, uh, I think that is, is what we call an advanced skill in journalism that can really help deepen your journalism if you understand what trauma does to individuals and communities. Because 
people in that shock stage will readily give interviews more than they will two or three days later when the arousal level of the trauma has dropped. I want to talk about the audience now, the second point, um, and how to make sure that uh, you know, you're reading traumatised audiences uh, well so that things are not gratuitous or uh, you're over uh, traumatising, I suppose, re-traumatising the audiences. The audience is not a level playing field, and that's true especially when we're dealing with vulnerable communities, like the general white population is audience is very different than, say, First Nations or refugee audiences. So really thinking about the ethics and the vulnerabilities uh, around uh, what, you, what you're sharing, I suppose, and what you're reporting on for those communities. The third one I want to focus on is the impact uh, of trauma on the journalist and the ethics, I suppose, or the moral compass around that. What we know with the uh, resilience research is that if a journalist has a very strong moral compass, that actually reinforces their resilience as long as they live by that moral compass. Um, if they breach their own moral compass, that can cause what we call a moral injury. Uh, so it's really important to understand your own ethical or moral compass uh, in terms of what you're going to do with traumatised or grieving uh, sources and talent uh, and audiences. So you can maintain your own uh, resilience in the face of this sort of reporting. We know that a journalist, uh, like it's a press freedom issue really, that if a journalist is traumatised to the point where they can no longer report on these things, uh, they're so we know many people who have left the profession because for various reasons, but often it's a trauma load. That if you understand uh, what trauma can do, become trauma literate, then you can start to monitor your own practice, your own trauma impacts, your own your own levels as you go along, and then implement uh, self-regulation strategies, self-care strategies, if you like. And newsrooms need to do this. They need to extend a duty of care. This should not be left up just to the individual journalist. These discussions need to be had at an editorial level with newsrooms where they are looking after staff and making sure that, of course, they're sending journalists into harm's way because that's the nature of the news business. But what are they going to do in terms of their ethical and moral standpoint to support uh, journalists? Uh, because really, it's it, it gets back to that the resilience. Uh, we know that journalists can cover a lot of horrible stuff, a lot of crap, if they have that good support from the organisation. Uh, the research shows that very readily. And at that point, I will finish. Thank you, Kate. Brilliant. Not too much over time, either you or Grant. I'm very pleased to hear this. So I'm going to pick this up with Ben, who has covered a lot of um, sexual assault, victims of family violence, etc. cetera. Um, the way we, we've definitely got a better understanding, thanks to lot, the likes of Kate and the Dart Centre and dedicated journalists over the years, where once upon a time we only thought um, journalists with you know war reporting experience had to have any understanding of trauma, but now we've got better at not just for ourselves but for others. How has uh, it changed? For for example, in in your career, have you seen a shift either around you, or have you changed your approach given what we now know about uh, the way people re respond to traumatic experiences themselves? Themselves. Yeah, I think I think there's been some improvement in the industry as a whole. I think I think it's got. I think the kind of work that Kate does in the Dart Center is is really, really important. Um, I think there's more of a conversation among uh, journalists about that. There's been some court cases and there's been you know plenty of examples of the damage it does to um journalists um that kind of like that building up of trauma that kate spoke about um I, I like the idea of that that you can kind of do small things that empower people who have been who experienced significant trauma whether it's you know child sex abuse or domestic violence i think that's really important uh because you know it's it's so disempowering the experiences they've gone through. So as a reporter, what I've done increasingly over time, the more vulnerable someone is, the more control I will give them over what they say. So for instance, I'll, I'll email back to them as a practice their comments. So they can see how they're gonna be um, 
they're going to be portrayed and what they're going to say. And it, it's useful because I think the consequences for them were if they felt they were quoted slightly out of context or, or what have you, uh, could, could kind of really reinforce that trauma. And so you're dealing with someone in a vulnerable position and it's really important that you don't do any extra harm. They've come to you, um, they want to tell their story, or you, you want to be sure of that, they want to tell your story. So you've got a, a real duty to them to do that in a way that doesn't make things worse, I guess. The story may not appear as they like, uh, and you'll get people who will be disappointed in particular ways because of the overall story or whatever. But at the very least, um, doing that, I think, is really, really important and, and, and good practice. Um, so I've started doing that more and more over time. Uh, it's not it's not the kind of courtesy you'd extend to a politician or what have you. You know, it's, it's, it's a completely different kind of situation, of, of course. Um, so I think that's important. I also think it's really important for reporters to be aware of the damage that can be done to you as well. I remember coming back from speaking to people who had, we did a series on the Catholic Church several years ago, and I would speak to a number of people who were victims of child sex abuse and everything. And you don't kind of acknowledge it, you just come back to work, but it has an effect on you and you need to, you need to find ways to kind of talk that through or try to park it to one side and not let it become too consuming, I guess. The old unmute button, sorry. Um, Kate, I want to come to you next, given, you know, the changes you would have seen over those 20 years you've been in the media. I've been sort of 30 odd. And these days we're facing constant crazy deadlines, intense work demands because you're often filing for more than <coughs> one platform or might not do it's online and then the paper or you might be doing others as well and sometimes impossible KPIs. How much can this affect your judgment or the judgment of your peers and the way that we can deal with vulnerable people? How much is that a, a, a pressure point? It's a, it's a huge issue. I mean, I, I started in the days where there was no website for the paper, um, scarily. And so all it was was the newspaper and you had the whole day to get your head around an issue. You had your whole day to approach the people that you needed to approach. And that also, in the cases of a, a sort of a tragedy that's, that's live, for want of a better word, it gives police the opportunity to tell the family and to tell the people involved and then also for that family then to spread the word amongst every everyone that they know so you had hours and hours and hours these days you don't have any time at all so not only do you constant and I'm not I don't stress very easily you know it's part of the job you just can't but even I sit there and think I just had to turn that story around you know 500 words around in 25 minutes did it did I get it right you know you think about that every day but and I'll give you an example of a time where we really thought ethically we'd got something right and, and we just did it. And I don't know what we could have done differently in this age of, of digital publishing, but there was a case of a police officer who was horrifically injured um, on the job to the point where they didn't expect him to live. And thankfully he did, but it was just a horror, horror situation. And his whole family didn't think he would live. We knew who he was. Um, you know, we had photographs of him, that kind of thing. Um, I, myself and my colleagues made many, many calls. To, have the parents been told? Does his partner know? And we were told, yep, they've, they've been told they're at his bedside, his partner's with him. And, and that went on for some hours. And we decided we would wait until the official sort of email, I suppose, went out to every police officer in the state. And I'm talking more than 10,000. And when that email went out, we thought, okay, this is a good time to basically say who he, who he is and, and publish those details. And it wasn't, it wasn't the right time because even though 12,000 police officers knew who he was, the people in his extended family didn't know it had happened yet. And despite that, despite waiting hours, despite saying his next of kin, aware, all that sort of stuff, the family still got dozens of phone calls from people, you know, outside of their inner circle saying I just I just saw this on the on the website so they were very upset with us and you know we apologized and and sort of you know made up for that but that was a situation where we tried really hard to make the right call in an age of digital deadlines and we and we still didn't 
Caro, once upon a time, a lot of the details of assaults or crimes or lewd behaviour over ministerial desks might never have made it to air or to publication. Have we gone too far? Have we pushed a taste privacy uh, um, boundary here in some senses? Look, <laughs> the big question, and look, I don't know if I'm the one to answer that, but I, because I, I actually want to pick up on what Kate and Ben have just been discussing. Um, you know, I think you guys would be experienced and deal with more of the, you know, immediacy and fast in, in your reporting, whereas I, I'm, I deal it with deep, long and slow investigations and both, 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 you know, forms of areas of journalism, fast turnaround, long format, deep dive, they present their own particular challenges. And, and when it's long and slow and deep, it presents a whole new raft of challenges. And, and Kate McMahon, what, you said the trajectory of trauma is something that has been a very, very big experience. And I think I've evolved more and grown more as a journalist and a human being than I ever have before making this series on the Lunar Park fire, because we had to understand that trajectory. Because we were asking these families and these witnesses to endure an 18 month long investigation really is, is, is how long this took to get there. And that is a whole resilience challenge in and of itself. And this tragedy, yes, it did occur 42 years ago, but we're resurrecting it all these decades later. And we really flipped the script, Kate McMahon, and you mentioned something about controversial, which is letting your, your subjects or your participants into the material before your broadcasting. And we did that this time around. And, and that went against all of my instincts because you want to keep it all here and keep it protected, particularly in a long investigation, because you're holding on to it to, to break this story. And we decided to conduct, we conducted not just the interviews with the participants for the content of the series, but we thought let's conduct a series of exit interviews. And those exit interviews is where we let the families into what, where we'd really reached in our investigation. This is well before we got to air so that they could understand what was coming, they could empower themselves. And we set up counselling sessions for the participants pre-broadcast and during production and post-broadcast also, so that they could handle this. And it worked beautifully. It really did. And I don't want to get emotional, but it, you know, you've got to change sometimes how you do things. I think that sounds like a really fantastic approach, even when you've got the time. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to go to some um, of the questions. There's quite a few comments as opposed to questions, but there is um, Tanya Branyuk. I apologise if I've mispronounced your name, Tanya, who's a journalist in a small country town, which she, she says, and I think this is um, true of a, a lot of small towns, um, that suffers from small town syndrome, where when you report something, people take it very seriously. Um, she attended her first accident a few weeks ago, took a photo of the truck no visible identifiers were present and got hammered from the community saying it was rude and bad reporting any tips on how to handle this let's go to you first Ben it's it's a really tricky one I look I haven't worked in a small town so I'm not sure I would know the dynamics super well but I think you can only you know you don't necessarily need to take criticism as a mark that you're doing the wrong thing but you also need to be aware of the social context and the community context that you're working in. So what might fly working for, you know, a bigger metro publication or a, a national organisation may not in a smaller country town. So I think you need to be cognisant of that, but don't necessarily uh, uh, take the criticism or the pushback as a bad as a bad thing. You've got to you've got to measure it against what your job is, which is to report uh, something that's going on, and have you acted in an ethical, fair way. Would be my response. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm going to put this to you, um, Kate, just and get your observation, um, is we've got this from Jay. Uh, when grief or trauma is reported around ethnic multicultural communities, in his opinion, or her, I apologise if I'm getting that wrong, ethics are at its worst. Why does that happen in Australian media? I think we've seen some pretty egregious examples of it, but um, what are your thoughts and observations? I think uh, we learn lessons around that all the time. Some of it is a bit of ignorance, um, a bit of lack of time to do things properly. Um, but certainly around that sort of stuff, we try and get better at that all the time. Um, and, and that in, often involves speaking to community leaders in those communities and asking them 
what is appropriate and and those conversations happen more in newsrooms today than they they ever have Caro, this one I think uh, is a good one for you. This is from Kate Thomas. I'd love to know how you approach someone who is a victim or a survivor and ask if they'd be interested in sharing their story. This is a really tough one, isn't it, to know what approach to take? It's really, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, oft sometimes the victim, well, the victim can be alive or the victim can actually be deceased. So then you've got to find, look, consent. Consent is is. Um, all about consent and you know as, as Grant said there is no common law right to privacy here in Australia but there is something called consent um, and it's about it, it, it's how you obtain that and how you get in there look you know if if that person is still alive uh, there are all sorts of ways to approach them you often rocking up on their door at their workplace can be extremely intimidating and is not a good idea basics 101 a letter is is often a, a great way to, to get in touch, phone call, of course, but a letter they can take, they can read, you can explain who you are, you can explain your purpose, um, and then they can, they can go away and, and, and mull it over. I always ask, what do you want? And that really will give you a whole lot of information to work with. And what do you not want? Yeah, what I would add that one of the- not want to that- happen. Yeah, is, is those kind of boundaries. It's just like, okay, and give a, a, a brief idea about this is what I'd like to ask. Are there any things you don't want to talk about? Are there any things you specifically do? I'm mm-hmm. going to actually put a, yeah, put a question to Kate McMahon. There are actually stacks for Kate, which I think is going to be another seminar at some stage. This is from Fran Malloy. Um, is there a best time ethically to interview people following trauma? For example, people are more li- who are more likely to speak to journalists in the immediate aftermath. Is regret common after that? Uh, after that? That's a great question. Look, the reality is, uh, and most of working journalists would probably know this, that immediately after an event, people are much more, very often, much more uh, ready to respond to to being interviewed. It's that people are still in that shock stage and they haven't come down from that realising, you know, what's really happened. Um, Look, and I always just say to journalists, the most important thing is how you do the, uh, the the interview, how you ask uh, the person, you know, how you frame it. If you just barge in and just assume they, you know, and put a microphone in front of their face, I don't think that's ethically an appropriate way to do things, but we still see that happening a lot. But if you are transparent, it's already been mentioned, if you're transparent, if you ask permission, the only time I suggest to journalists not to interview someone is when they're clearly dissociative. You know, it's that lights on, no one there. Because when someone's dissociative, they're still stuck in the trauma and they cannot give informed consent. They are still feeling like the trauma is happening and they are not aware. And it's very often those people that that not so much regret, but have a shock when they see on the next page, the page the next day, oh my God, I don't even remember being interviewed. So that's part of that dissociative. And I'd say that's the the real no-no because you cannot ask for informed consent. But if you're ethical, if you're open, if you're transparent, and you ask, then I think it's an appropriate time to interview people. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. And Kate, would you mind putting your email address or contact details in the chat? Because there are quite a number of quite specific questions for you that I think would be worth you having a look at. So if people have specific questions for Kate, I think it might be best to contact her directly or or have a look at the Dart Centre question. I'm going to go to our last question because we are kind of running out of time here. And this is from Venus Kalesi. And I want each of our um, journalist panellists to just give us a brief response to this. What are the key roadblocks to being a 10 out of 10, going back to Karen's ethicalness in Australian journalism conversation? And what advice would you have to responding to the current ethical gaps? Uh, We'll start with Kate. Okay, the number one roadblock in a newsroom is all of your managers because they are not there on the road seeing things and talking to the people that you've spoken to. They don't have the same understanding of the story that you do. They haven't sat in someone's lounge room while they've cried over a photo album and and, and told you their story. They've only got your copy and they're the ones who put the paper together or put the website together, place the pictures, write the headlines. So that communication in the newsroom is so vital and it makes a huge difference if you're a senior reporter and very stubborn or passionate or a junior reporter who might feel like they can't question things. So... Um, giving 
the managers in the newsroom who are completely removed from the trauma that you've just seen, giving them that understanding and communicating with them is, is very important. Great. Caro, your thoughts on that? How do we get to 10 to 10, 10 out of 10? Number one roadblock for me is you, yourself. Um, not so much your managers, because if you're not across your code of ethics, your organisation's code of ethics, and you're not in touch with your own moral compass, and particularly if you're not really across the law, Grant McAvaney, if you're not you know, working with the lawyers too, that's your, that is your biggest roadblock is you. So it's, it, it's on you to get there to a 10 out of 10. Um, but of course, you need that managerial support. I'm with Kate there. Um, and Karen, did you ask something specific then? Did I miss it? Uh, it was, I think we, we're kind of running out of time. I'm going to go to Ben okay. now. But I don't want people to um, have to uh, um, ring off too soon. Ben Schneiders, what do you think? How do you get to 10 out of 10? Yeah, look, I, I think I think it's a mix of those two things. It's, it's obviously, it's on you to act in an ethical way and to be aware of your ethical responsibilities. Um, but I also think the industry... Um, and managers and editors play a big role. It's, 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 I think what I said earlier, it's that ability to be able to say no and not fear repercussions, to do things that cross boundaries or touch up against boundaries. Um, and I think that's a problem for large parts of the industry that is under particular financial pressures and the like um, to get a story, to compete, to get the thing up first online. Um, and... If you can't, if you don't feel like you can say no, that's when I think some really bad things happen. And I think um, the code of ethics is, you know, both a sword and a shield. It is actually protection for you to say the code of ethics says we are an ethical organisation or we should be an ethical organisation. Here's our roadmap to it. And that's the 12 steps or 12 provisions of the code of ethics. And there is also the sword side of things, which we haven't got into today, is that members of the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance in the media section are subject to investigation, potential investigation into breaches of the code of ethics. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of serves serves both of those purposes. We are out of time. Um, this has been a really fantastic conversation. Um, I feel really honoured to have been with the, the five of you today. So uh, if everybody could put together their virtual uh, hands together, uh, a round of applause for our terrific guests today. Caro Meldrum Hanna, Kate Kiriakou, Ben Schneiders, Grant McAvaney and Kate McMahon. The proceeds for today's webinar, the $10 you all paid, uh, goes to the Media Safety and Solidarity Fund, which was established in 2000. And five and assist and assist our colleagues in the Asia Pacific region in times of emergency and war and in hardship. So um, thank you very much for your interest. Thank you so much for um, the, the money that you've paid for that. Uh, we do have another event in about a month's time. That's on Thursday, July the 1st at 5.30 p.m., where we're looking at uh, the code of ethics provisions, looking at plagiarism and also the provision that looks at truth and accuracy in the use of photographs, video and audio. Thank you all so much uh, for being here today. For our guests, um, have a wonderful afternoon.